I'm Jonathan Larson with TYT Investigates, and I have a news story up this morning that I wanted to talk to you about for today's edition of TYT I Daily. Uh, the headline is Meet the Black People Who Helped Make Mayor Pete, which sounds like a little bit of a feature story, but, but we actually have uh, a, a considerable amount of story, new information actually... in there that, um, that uh, I want to tell you about today. So uh, probably the biggest headline, I would guess, is that... Um, the, uh, it turns out, so we knew, we've known for years, since 2012, that Pete Buttigieg decided to replace his black fire chief. Um, actually, we didn't know that he decided. All we knew was that the black fire chief, a guy named Howard Buchanan, was retiring, and um, so Buttigieg obviously replaced him. Now, the AP last month reported that the reason Buchanan, uh, the reason Buttigieg replaced him, uh, excuse me, the reason that Buchanan retired was because Buttigieg decided to replace him, not the other way around. I spoke to Buchanan, and what he shared with me was that he, yes, he actually had decided to retire three years before, but uh, if you are paying attention to the minutia here, which I wasn't for far too long, uh, he didn't schedule his retirement for January 1st, 2012, when a new mayor would come in. He scheduled it for February 1st, 2012, one month after. And when I met with him in South Bend last month, he told me that the reason he did it that way was so that he would have the option of retiring if he and the new mayor, assuming uh, the current mayor didn't run again, which is what happened, uh, he and the new mayor would have a month to see, to work together and see how they got along. And uh, if it didn't work out for either of them, then, then Buchanan could retire as planned. Point being, he did not want to retire. He was planning his retirement in the event it became necessary because of incompatibility with the new mayor. But here's the thing, he never even got the chance to find out whether or not he would be compatible with the new mayor, with Pete Buttigieg. Why? Because in December of 2011, Pete Buttigieg and his campaign manager, then and now Mike Schmuel, met with other candidates and Buchanan for the fire chief's job. And to give you some sense of how, how thin the line is between information coming out and not coming out, um, it's obviously been public knowledge for years who the person was who replaced um, Howard Buchanan. It's a guy named Steve Cox, who was an assistant chief, and, and by, by even Howard B Buchanan's own estimation, was a fine assistant chief. Um, nothing against him, but I was, the way I found out what I'm about to tell you is, I was on the phone with someone talking about um, the then new fire chief, Steve Cox, and they mentioned that his dad was a lawyer named Bruce. And I kind of went, wait, what? And the, the person I was talking to couldn't remember Bruce's last name. And I said, was it Bruce Bondurant? Yes, that was it, the guy says. And the reason I knew the name Bruce Bondurant was because I hadn't reported until today, but I've actually obtained uh, Buttigieg's initial campaign filings for his 2000 mayoral race. These are the 2010 annual filings, which show the money that came in primarily in December, I think maybe exclusively in December of 2010. And I, so I knew who Bruce Bondurant was. He was a Republican lawyer uh, who had given Buttigieg $500. So that's how I found out that Buttigieg decided to replace the black fire chief, who just three months before his interview had been named Indiana Fire Chief of the Year, with the stepson of a Republican lawyer who was also a big Buttigieg donor. This, of course, is the second chief that we found out was uh, removed from his position by Buttigieg where there was some connection or some alleged connection or some apparent connection with Buttigieg donors. In this case, it was literally the stepson of the uh, Republican donor who gave Buttigieg $500. In the case of the police chief, it's been alleged in, these, in the documents that I reported on in September that white police officers discussed using Buttigieg's donors to get rid of the black chief. Um, so 
Uh, the other person I met with while I was in South Bend, I, I met with more than two, but the other, as you can see, there are two gentlemen here at the top of my article. That's Chief Howard Buchanan. This is Captain Howard, uh, Kenny Marks, who was in 2011, the president of the Firefighters Union. Uh, so I found out where Kenny Marks was working and I went and I rang the doorbell of the fire stout house and uh, it was freezing, but uh, he let me in. I introduced myself and then I made the brilliant move of saying to him, you're not what I was, I said, I'm looking for Kenny Marks. He says, I'm Kenny Marks. I say, oh, you're not what I was expecting. And he responds, what was that? White? So that's the kind of genius charm that I uh, am able to, to put out and make a first impression as a reporter. Um, but luckily for me, Kenny agreed. He couldn't speak to me there. He's obviously on the job. He's in the uh, firehouse. He, can't, he couldn't speak to me there. He said, you know, let's meet later uh, off, the, off the work site and, and I'll, I'll talk to you then. And the reason, uh, the reason I wasn't expecting Kenny Marks to be white was because I knew he was black. And the reason I knew he was black was because he's described in Buddha Judge's book. And the description that Buddha Judge gives is of uh, a meeting that he and Mike Shmuel have with Kenny Marks and the Firefighters Union in early 2011 to get the endorsement of the union that Kenny Marks is leading at the time. And I want to play for you. I found the, the audio clip where Buddha Judge discusses this in his book. He discusses the meeting, and it's kind of a fascinating description, and it set my expectations sort of differently from. Um, from what I saw, the kind gentleman who let me into his firehouse out of the cold. So I'm going to play that clip for you right now. Hold on. Many of the rank and file appreciated my stand for auto workers during the treasurer fight, but they also felt loyal to Dvorak because of his stances in the state house. I courted the ones that hadn't already promised to support him. The sheet metal workers came through quickly, and the firefighters signaled they were open to a conversation. So Mike and I, fresh-faced and clean-cut, went to meet them at their hall. Sitting with his fellow union officers at a big round table opposite Mike and me, Kenny Marks, the president, heard me out. A big man who was also a deacon at Mount Carmel, the fastest-growing black church in town, he leaned back in his seat and shifted between knowing glances at his fellow firefighters and piercing stares at us. He seemed interested but skeptical. I like what I'm seeing, and I like what you're saying. But how do I know you're not just another sweet-talking devil trying to get my pants off? It was hard to think of a good answer to that, so I kept on with the pitch. I don't know about that, but you'll be able to hold me accountable for what we achieved from day one. You could never be sure, but I felt that our case was convincing, and that the groups we sat down with were responsive. Indeed, the Firefighters Local 362 came through with an endorsement complete with T-shirts. So that was the section uh, where Rudy Judge discusses him and Mike Schmuel, their fresh face, f fresh faced and clean cut, if you didn't notice, um, meeting with Kenny Marks and the Firefighters Union. And uh, Buddha Judge, if you noticed in his in his description of the encounter, he doesn't explain why the uh, why the firefighters union decided to endorse him. He says uh, that he told them they'd be able to hold him accountable on day one, which is no more true of him than it would be of anyone else. There was no, there were no specifics given of why would we, why and how would we be able to hold you accountable. So I asked, I asked Kenny, um, why Buttigieg? And he, he said um, that Buttigieg talked about three things that he didn't hear uh, from the other candidates, diversity, inclusion, and transparency. And by the way, um, when I spoke with Kenny, he spoke to me on camera, and we're going to post that interview at some point, um, I expect this week, so I hope you'll look for that. But the, 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 among the things that struck me, one is the sort of imposing borderline sinister figure that, that Buttigieg describes was, was a contrast with, with the man I met at the firehouse. Um, and that was, that was why I said, you're not what I was expecting. But the other thing that occurred to me about all of this was that phrase, how do I know you're not just another sweet talking devil trying to get my pants off? And Kenny doesn't remember saying it, but he doesn't rule it out either. Uh, 
and and it occurred to me pretty quickly that for all Kenny knew, I was the same thing. Um, and so I asked Kenny how he felt now about Buttigieg, and he said the phrase, the phrase was, he fooled me, he fooled me. He says that multiple times. Uh, he says he's embarrassed to be in the book. He feels like he's part of the pitch, um, just as he was back in 2012. The endorsement certainly was part of the pitch, and he knew it at the time, excuse me, 2011. Now, however, he feels that um, essentially he, he, his endorsement has been used in the book in a way that doesn't reflect who he is and where he is today. Um, I have other, there's a lot of other details um, in, in the piece. I, I, okay, I'll skip ahead. I talk about the, um, the assistant mayor, the special assistant to the mayor, uh, Lynn Coleman, who would not speak with me, but um, I heard from another, uh, one of his peers, uh, Tom Price, went on the record with me. Um, Lynn Coleman is black, Tom Price is white, but Tom Price gave me uh, lots of details, as did Howard Buchanan, who was speaking with Lynn Coleman. They both talked about the experience that Coleman had during the campaign and during the, the transition, right? Because remember, once Buttigieg wins, now he and Shmuel are in the building working with, ostensibly, ostensibly working with Coleman and others to accomplish the transition of government. It was not a respectful or um, positive experience as far as uh, Price and Buchanan account recounted it to me. Um, the uh, very little communication with, with Coleman, with others, um, the staff that the incoming team was, talking, was interested in talking to, the only Licky staff they were interested in talking to or were particularly focused on maybe keeping as part of the new administration were young peppy people. Young, of course, that's a violation of, of hiring laws, right? You're not allowed to like say, hey, we wanna hire young people. No, that, that's discrimination, sorry. You know, not supposed to do that. Um, the other thing that I mentioned earlier that I got the donors, uh, I got the filing um, from the 2010 uh, reporting period. There were 56 donors in there. And um, back in December and January, we actually spent a lot of time digging into each and every one of them. Who are they? Uh, and part of what I was trying to look at was um, trying to interrogate Buttigieg's claim that he didn't come from part of a machine. Um, which one of the other mayoral candidates, the de uh, nominee, uh, pursuing the nomination for, for the Democratic Party for mayor, called BS, the idea that Buttigieg was not part of uh, a machine. Um, and it does turn out that there are multiple networks, uh, including political networks, that Buttigieg drew on at the time to wildly, wildly outraise uh, his opponents. The other thing we found among these 56 donors which included businesses and political groups and 47 individuals. When you include people who owned and ran the businesses and, and all the individuals, um, individual donors, we were only able to identify four people who were not white. Um, by contrast, we were able to find five white people named Brown who gave to the uh, donation, who, who either personally donated or were involved in running companies that, that donated. Um, of those four white non-donors. Uh, three of them were men. One of them was a woman of Japanese descent. Um, Buttigieg got not a single donation from a black man, but he did get one from a white partner at the firm of Black Man and Graham, a, a Texas law firm. Uh, and it turned out I was very intrigued by the existence of a $10,000 check coming to Buttigieg in South Bend, Indiana from Flower Mound, Texas. So I dug around a little bit and it turned out that Black Man and Graham um, had actually retained the services, the legal services of Joe Donnelly, formerly an Indiana senator, congressman, um, back in the aughts. They had retained, they had, they had retained his services uh, for legal work and the law partner Tom Black, who gave that $10,000 check, he and Donnelly were both Notre Dame alumni. Keep in mind, Joe Donnelly was the former boss of Mike Schmuel. So, um, and altogether, the, non, the four non-white donors accounted for $200 out of um, more than $50,000 that Buttigieg raised. 
Um, by contrast, um, I'm basically just reading my own story now because it's all up here somewhere. Uh, by contrast, three Republican donors wrote checks to Buttigieg totaling $6,000. That, that we know of. We didn't check out party affiliation for everyone. So um, anyway, I... Uh, oh yeah, here's, here's a couple other things I want to share. Um, I found an interview that Buttigieg gave at the end of his first year in office where the South Bend Tribune asked him about the Boykins uh, incident, him demoting the, fir the city's first black police chief, and also um, asked him about critics generally saying that his administration wasn't diverse and, and or wasn't committed to diversity. And he said, quote, the suggestion that my administration isn't committed to diversity is outrageous. And it, was, it struck me because it's an extraordinarily forceful pushback on an issue where Buttigieg on the campaign trail, the presidential campaign trail, has been much more uh, remorseful and conciliatory. He, he, when he was challenged in the presidential race, for instance, uh, in the presidential debate about the diversity of the South Bend police force, he said, we couldn't get it done. Uh, in addition to that quote where he says, suggesting that his administration isn't committed to diversity is outrageous, I also obtained some private communications, which suggested, which, which sort of hinted at a similar kind of resentment at being challenged on this stuff, on issues of race, um, privately. I, I obtained a 2017 email in which Buttigieg and various officials are talking about an, an online Facebook posting that goes into some detail on complaints that the black community have. Um, one of the, the quote I include in the article from this Facebook post, which was posted by the local chapter of Indivisible, wrote, writes, it says, quote, young black activists have pressed South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg and his administration on matters of diversity and inclusion related to safe, affordable, and quality housing and economic development to no avail. Buttigieg responds, not to Indivisible, but to, his, but to the various officials he's talking to uh, in this internal email. His response is, quote, where are they getting this crap from? There are, there are, other, there are other things in the story that, that may be of interest, but obviously it's, um, the, the overall theme here is that there were, there were black, the phrase I use is black muscle showed up for him in the campaign. Um, Howard Buchanan, Kenny Marks, uh, Cordell, uh, uh, whose last name is not given in the book, but I found him and I spoke to him. He was a young black man who worked on the campaign. They, they all helped elect Buttigieg. They helped him make inroads in the black community. That was confer confirmed to me by white people in a position to know as well. Hispanic uh, officials in the fire department did the same thing. They had, they had traction. They had credibility in the Hispanic community, just like Buchanan did in the black community, they went to their family members, they went to their communities, and they said, Buttigieg is our guy. And those communities got behind Buttigieg. And of course, uh, Buchanan ended up losing his job. Marx, the union president, was voted out as union president later that year, precisely because so many of the rank and file had wanted to go in a different direction with their, with their nomination. Um, and... Uh, I, I had a pretty frank discussion with Kenny Marks about the, the sort of dynamic of me coming to his doorstep and asking him for help about another white guy coming to his doorstep and asking him for his help. And, and I said, you know, I have my own agenda too. I'm, I'm a journalist who wants to find out what you have to say, what you think, what you know, what you heard, what you said back in 2011. That is my agenda, and I am here to try to get you to, to, talk, your, <laughs> to talk your pants off uh, in order to, to get you to do that. Um, and so we talked about that, that dynamic, um, and, and Kenny shared with me, um, and you know, I hope it comes through that you know, this means something, right, to ask for someone's trust about an incident where they felt that their trust was betrayed, that they gave their trust and it was betrayed, to ask for their trust again, that's a powerful thing. And to receive it in response, that's a really powerful thing. So um, I wanted to end by, by reading some of what Kenny told me. 
he let me sit there and read that passage to him from the book. And he said he was embarrassed to be in the book. And I said, why are you embarrassed? And he said, quote, if his lack of diversity as the mayor of the city of South Bend was so blatantly obvious, why then would he mention that a large black man would endorse him in any way? So the embarrassment for me was knowing that who and what I am as a person was being used to continue to push his agenda. A name in a book is just a name. Nobody has any idea that they have a six foot two, 295 pound man of color. Nobody has any idea of that when you're reading the book. So I, you know, I wanted people to know that that was how he felt. And um, the Buttigieg campaign did not respond. I asked them to respond to uh, various specifics that we would be reporting. Uh, I asked them a, a few questions, if they could confirm, deny various specific factual elements of the story. And um, we did not hear back. Obviously, we'll update the story if we do. So with that, I'm going to take a look at what you folks have to say in the chat box, which, as you know, is uh, kind of the highlight of this for me whenever we do this. Um, so thanks, as always, for, uh, for chiming in and sharing your thoughts. Um, Imperator One says, looks like a small crowd this morning. Everyone is still hungover. So I'm actually surprised I haven't heard yet anyone accuse me of dropping this story on the morning of the Iowa caucus. But this is a terrible time to release a news story about anything, right? It's coming after that amazing Super Bowl uh, with that mind-blowing, um, super cool halftime show. And it's on the morning of the Iowa caucus, right? It's amazing that anyone's paying attention to this story. But, but for those of you who are, thank you very much. Um, Okay, let's see. Uh, a lot of good mornings. Uh, Milo, Milo Wadlin says, JL always liked you best. I made a joke about liking best the person, Imperator One, who was the first person to show up this morning. Uh, Milo Wadlin says, the beard returns. It's never completely gone. This is the ongoing saga of will I let my facial hair come in and for how long. Imperator One says, so the story seems to be that Mayor Pete is just cravenly beholden to his donors, like generally. So... I don't, we don't know that, right? Um, I've been asking since April to sit down with Mayor Buttigieg and talk to him about all this stuff. Uh, we can't conclude that he's just cravenly beholden. Maybe he was inexperienced. Maybe he had no deep connections with city government, didn't know those people. And the same people who supported him financially were also the ones telling him, you're, you're the one to fix all these problems. We can help you. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a benign meaning it lacks overt malice explanation for this, but it's an explanation that still has within it the seeds of systemic racism and certainly the absence of a proactive um, systemic approach to ensuring that you're not propagating it, I would say. DLJ says, this is investigative journalism at its finest. Bravo. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, boy, I hope it gets better because I got to tell you guys, like, I screwed up on this story so bad. Howard Buchanan, the fire chief, the former fire chief, I was familiar with his name very early on when I began looking into South Bend because his departure is cited in the lawsuit of Daryl Boykins, the police chief, as part of a pattern of clearing out black leadership in the city. And But when I went back and looked at the local media, it said he retired. And I don't know whether I'm naive or an idiot or I, I had too much faith. I was either too focused on the police angle of stuff or I had too much faith in the local media that I assumed in the seven, eight years since that if there were more to the story than that he retired, it would have come out by now. The, the shortcomings of the local media um, are something that I've repeatedly tripped over in terms of assuming it would have come out, right? Um, and so I screwed up in that respect. And also Kenny Marks. Um, Kenny Marks was in the book. He's in the book. So why is it that it's only a year later that I'm finally turning my attention to Kenny Marks, right? Why is it that no one else has? This is crazy. So if this is investigative journalism at its finest, thank you for that. But man, we've got to do better. We've got to do better. Uh, Grammy Bernie Bros has been trying to send a super chat since the start of streaming and it keeps timing out. I'll double it next time. Thank you for staying on top of this. Thank you, uh, Grammy. That's very kind of you. 
And I'm, I'm sorry that the, uh, the super chat is, is timing out on you. Um, let's see. Uh, you guys are exchanging some personal information, which I don't want to ruin your credit score or anything by, by talking about publicly, so I'll just skip that. Um, Taria says, Taria donates, Taria0110 donates $10 and says, this is the journalism we need. Please keep it up. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, I hope you know it's not only if it's the journalism you need, it's also the journalism you've, you've created, right? I, I say this every time one of you folks is kind enough to chip something in, which is that even if you're not chipping something in, your time, your attention, your focus, your support makes this possible. Travis Washington says, Mayor Pete is only power money, power and money hungry from my observation. And while some may not call him a racist, as a black man, I know a racist when I see one. Um, I will say, I will say this, I'm certainly not going to, to argue with that. Um, but I, I've, I've yet to hear from black people in South Bend that they consider him a racist. That may be kind of not true. But, but for the most part, I think, the assumption is that he doesn't bear actual malice towards black people, but that for whatever other reasons, as we've talked about, um, there has been an absence, a shortfall of the kind of proactive measures that you need to take to ensure that money and elitism and privilege, even without overt non-systemic personal individual racism, don't crowd out black people, black representation, black power, uh, black interests. Travis Washington says, and for the record, I don't think simply being white automatically makes someone a racist. It's, it's about someone's actions. It's about one's actions and who they support and who supports them. So um, I, I'm probably a little bit older than you are, Travis. And, and I tell people a lot, younger people, that when, so I, I grew up in the 70s. I wasn't, I wasn't politically attuned or anything like that, but uh, I guess I grew up in the 80s as well. But, but it was pretty much... Democratic Party orthodoxy to assume that you were racist. Not, not you, but us. We were all racist. We all had that in us. Even if we didn't have overt fear or malice, there were still assumptions and stereotypes and, and things of that nature that, that, that we had to actively work against. And one of the thing, things that troubles me about, about the sort of modern left calling out racism and other people saying, you're racist, is that it tends to suggest you're racist in comparison to me, who is not racist and therefore has no self-inquiry uh, to do, no self-interrogation to do, nothing to find inside themselves, nothing to work against. And so I, I certainly agree with the sentiment of what you're saying, Travis, but I also think we, we've, it's important that we reopen that door to, to the idea of inherent racism. And look, this, it's not a secret that, that members of the black community will talk about how there's racism within the black community based on the, the shade of the color of people's skin or features. Um, let's see. Uh, Leroy Beresford or Leroy says definitely a pattern forming with Pete and people of color. Imperator One says I buried the lead. I don't even know which lead because I I <laughs> I had I crammed so much stuff into this one piece that I um I sort of forgot. Wait, what's the big what's the big deal here? What's the big part of the story? Um, let's see. Uh, Milo Wadlin says doesn't leave me with a good feeling about Mayo Mayor Pete. Sorry, Mayo Pete. Um, is what they wrote. It's not a nickname I use. But, but here, you know, I, I don't like to do that Monday morning quarterbacking thing, especially the day after the Super Bowl, but of saying, here's what the campaign should have done. But, you know, at a minimum, I would say that the Buttigieg campaign should have had me, should have given me access a long time ago, 
Not necessarily because then I would have been nice to you, but because you use that as an opportunity to get in front of stuff, right? That's part of what a campaign is about. When you see the train coming, wait, that's a bad analogy. You don't get in front of a train. When you see problems coming, you get in front of them. You, you tell them in a way that reflects as positively as possible on your experience at the time, on your character, on your handling of it. If you want to, to spin it, and I don't mean lie, but just frame it as a redemption story, you can't do that if you're not the one telling the story. So to me, I think that seems to me like a, an unforced error. Uh, Sarah says, JL, I was going to try and scan your article, although it's probably long. How dare you? And yes, you're right, it's long. I'm sorry, I'm terrible at this. Uh, Dennis Miller says, will you submit this to the New York Times for publishing? I will not, Dennis. Um, I will, however, submit it to the TYT. Dennis wrote, will you submit this to the NYT? I'm going to submit this to the TYT. We've already published it at the, at, uh, here at TYT Investigates, so it's already up and published. Um, and uh, I work for TYT, and they paid for me to do this investigative reporting, so it would be really bad to then give it to the New York Times. Uh, Jessica says, Mayor Pete is avoiding you. That's literally true, actually. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Imperator One says, Jessica, I'm sure he, I think Buttigieg, has not watched any of this, but if he has, then he definitely doesn't want to chat with JT. I guess that's me. Um, I, I don't know. I would think, like, I don't think I come on here as, like, a, a Buttigieg basher. I mean, Mike Harriet of The Root, with whom I collaborated on, on the previous article, he called him a uh, booty judge, a lying mf -er in a, a lying mf in a headline, and he got an interview. So I'm like, well, would what would you, why why not me? I'm all kinds of nice and polite. I defend you when people uh, ascribe your actions to to uncool motives. You know, I try to avoid. I try to prevent people from jumping to conclusions about his character, or whatever. So, to me, it what what it says is that. Um, I've seen Buttigieg do very few interviews with people who um, had a deep uh, factual knowledge of relationships, money, who is talking to whom, and is interested in diving deep into, okay, let's talk about June 2011. Who were you talking to? All this kinds of stuff. He doesn't do those kinds of interviews. And for all I know, no one's asking him to. Um, the Associated Press kind of did, and they kind of got some answers, but they didn't, they don't seem to have really gone into detailed specifics with him. And, and look, the other thing is, I have questions that I want to ask Buttigieg about things that he doesn't know I know, because I haven't published them yet. So, um, you know, maybe they're making a calculated gamble on their end that, you know what, whatever positive stuff might come out of talking with Jonathan, um the risk is too great, right, of, of getting caught on something on camera. They might not be wrong. It might be a very good, very smart calculation. But if they're making that calculation, that tells me that they think they'll get caught on something. So, in conclusion, let's do that interview, Mayor Pete. Um, Sarah says, JL, I can't even sign up. I don't understand the website. I can't use TYT either. Is it okay if I cry here? I'm so sorry, Sarah. I don't know what's going on. There should be, there should be some sort of like customer service something. Um, but uh, if, you don't, if you're not able to find or locate someone who can, who can help you out, uh, DM me your contact info on Twitter, okay? And I'll see if I can connect you with our, customer, our friendly customer service representatives. Um, same thing with you, uh, Mayor Buttigieg. <laughs> DM me anytime. Um, I'll be happy to connect you with a representative. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, Milo Wadland says, I agree that there is some racism in all of us and we must be ever vigilant. Imperator One says, I think the country as a whole is racist in different ways. From tinges of white supremacy and colorism to colorism, racist culture is pervasive and we must both confront it and be self-reflective. Mike Harriet made a really good point um, at, uh, of several, but 
he sort of suggested, I think when, when he and I spoke, that he's more comfortable or think it's more suitable to use the phrase white supremacy. And I, I have to confess, I don't know that I've really grappled with the full meaning and ramifications of what he said, but it's, it's, it's in there and hopefully at some point it, it takes root, no pun intended, and I, I wrap my head around it better than I have so far. William Sullivan says, the simpler self-analysis to make is bias, is there bias in one's critical thinking? Bias includes all aspects are welcome to good decision making. Uh, I think I'm understanding what you're saying. And yeah, I think that's true. There's a lot of, of things other than, uh, you know, race-based bias that can screw up our decision making, critical thinking and all that. Travis Washington says, I'm 53 and retired army. I'm from the South and I have friends from all ethnicities. I've experienced direct and passive racism and I call it as I see it from my experiences. So Travis, I owe you an apology. Uh, I am not older than you. We're exactly the same age. Um, and thank you for sharing your experiences and your, your, experience and your perspective based on them. Uh, Bookaholic Blue says, Mayor Pete appears to listen to people that can help his ambitions. Sarah laughs at me for apologizing for the fact that my article is long. She says, long is only bad because I got here late, less time to read it. I really can't seem to read the article at that link. It wants me to create a creator account or something. I did try. Ooh, I'm going to, I'll definitely, I'll check out the link once I'm, once I'm done, guys. And, and it'll be right in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. Milo Wadlin says, maybe if you call Judge an MF, he will feel the need to win you over and we'll give you an interview. I know, right? I'm tempted. I'm literally tempted. Um... Uh, Real Life Jolie says, sorry, everyone, but could someone please do a closed caption on this? I mean, seriously, it's too quiet for me to hear this guy. Wait, really? Is my audio not good or something? That's not good. Sorry about that. Is that new or is that throughout? I, no one else has mentioned it. Um, okay, so uh, you folks are done and I'm done. Um, so I'm going to say thanks for checking out uh, my reporting. I will go back and... Uh, oh, God, I see now. I totally did the wrong link. Um, that's our CMS. Uh, okay, so I apologize for that, uh, and I'll fix it. And I will get up video of my interviews with Kenny Marks and Howard Buchanan. Um, and if you didn't see it already, I believe it was last week, we posted a video of my interview with Stephanie Jones, whose son, uh, Jihad Vasquez, 16 years old, was found hanged to death in South Bend, um, excuse me, just outside the, the jurisdiction. She, they're from South Bend. Um, okay, so uh, what do I always say at the end of these things? I say, please take care of each other. Please take care of yourselves. And uh, if I don't see you tomorrow, 11.30 a.m. Eastern time, you will see me because I'll have put up one of the taped interviews. So until then, take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. I just said that. Why would I say that again? Bye, guys. <laughs>